y'all, welcome back to Carlton Carnivores. I've got a special video for you guys today uh, featuring one of my uh, favorite uh, reptile species that I've got here at this house, simply because they're one of the best to use to introduce people to snakes and get them over their fear. Uh, before we start though, just a quick reminder, uh, support for these videos does come from my patrons at patreon.com slash hcarlton, as well as donations through Coffee ko-fi.com slash carltoncarnivores, as well as those who purchase things at the shop on my website at carltoncarnivores.com. Any little bit certainly helps, goes a long way. So, uh, the snakes that I have for you today, I've actually got a pair of them uh, that I have as pets. Quite a few more that are in the house right now, but we'll get to that in a little bit. And these guys are a very small species, very easy to keep generally, and fairly popular pets, but not everybody is familiar with them. And that is the Kenyan sand boas. Now this is Irwin. He is your classic looking Kenyan sand boa, uh, Eryx or Gongolophus colubrinus. Uh, there's a bit of disagreement on which genus they should actually be in right now, but a lot of most people, I think, still recognize them as being in the genus Eryx. Uh, sand boas in general are an old world animal found in semi-arid and arid regions of southern Europe, Africa, and Asia. And they come in a number of different species, uh, at least eight or nine. And the most popular, though, is the Kenyan sand boa, these guys right here. Uh, they are found from uh, Egypt and Niger in northern Africa down along the eastern half of the continent of Africa, down into Kenya and Tanzania, where they live, again, in semi-arid to arid environments, so uh, rocky deserts, sandy desert areas, uh, savannas, any place where they have uh, places with uh, very loose, sandy soil that they can easily burrow through. That's what they prefer. And so, uh, as the name suggests, again, they are in that sand. They live fossorially, underground. They're burrowers. So it's very, very rare to see them up on the surface. You have to kind of go digging in order to find them, usually. Although, they will sometimes come up on the surface and um, forage at night, because they are a nocturnal animal. I'll bring up a couple of photos here for you guys to see. These guys do have elliptical pupils, so that vertical slit shape. Um, that does change, of course, depending on the light level. In very low light, those slits open up into round pupils to let in more light. And then when it's brighter, they uh, close up again. So these guys are active at night, and they are ambush hunters. Uh, with this fat, stocky body shape, uh, they're not really designed uh, to be pursuit predators like, say, racers and coach whips or the mambas of Africa are. So these guys are designed to sit and wait. They have their eyes kind of set up on top of their head uh, so that they will bury themselves in the just the tip, the top of their head, the tip of their snout uh, exposed, and then they will wait for prey to walk by. Uh, these guys will take basically any small animal that walks by uh, be it small lizards or uh, rodents. They will sometimes find birds, and they are actually known occasionally for raiding the nests of ground-nesting birds. So they're fairly generalist in what they will eat, although most often they will be taking small rodents or lizards. Now these guys, uh, you can see the color here. He's got this model pattern of kind of orange and then these dark brown black blotches. That kind of helps camouflage them, breaks up their silhouette when they're either on the surface moving through rocks or when they're actually partially buried in soil that helps kind of camouflage them with the color of their environment. Now in captivity though, uh, we have bred out uh, several recessive mutations uh, that we found in these guys. Uh, I've got another one. That's the male. The other snake that I have is the female. This is Marmara, once we get her out. Hi, oh, yeah. I'm picking you up. <laughs> now you'll notice, right off the bat, Marmara is a little larger than Irwin is. We'll get to that in a second. But she is also, you'll notice, a very different coloration from 
Irwin. She is what is called a paradox snow sand boa, so she has two recessive mutations in her. She has paradox amelanism, often incorrectly called albinism, which takes away most of the black pigment in her. The paradox version of this gene, uh, they're not entirely sure how it works, but for whatever reason, you can see a little bit on her side here. Um, it actually causes a bit of the black to come back into her pattern. So uh, you have this mostly uh, light colored snake, but then it just has these little dots, splotches, and uh, freckles of black color that shows up again. And then she's also got, uh, either, it's either azanthism or anerythrism, whether it's uh, xanthin or erythrin pigment that they, that the normal snake has that gives them the orange color. Uh, this uh, mutation takes away that as well. So when you bring both of them together, you have a snake that's lacking most of its black and then all of its orange, so you end up with a snake that only has basically the iridophore, the light reflecting cells within its skin that produces the color and pattern. So the areas with white have the iridophores and they reflect, reflect a lot of light, and then the areas that don't have those iridophores where the black used to be, turns out kind of this pale, tan, fleshy color. So you have this very paled out uh, colored animal. There's a lot of other mutations as well. There's um, the Rufescens mutation, which kind of creates kind of this sandy reddish brown color and often almost stripe looking. There's an actual stripe mutation, which opens up all those blotches down the back. So you get this stripe right down the back and several others. So because they're popular in captivity, a lot of mutations are being found because they're getting bred so often. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you may have noticed that Irwin, though he is fairly large, is still a fair bit smaller than Marmara, who actually will continue growing for quite a while. So Irwin will not continue growing. He is at full size. So males of this species max out at around 18 to 20 inches in length. They usually don't get any bigger than that. Females, on the other hand, uh, partly because they're the ones that have to carry the babies, will grow a fair bit bigger. So um, they'll get up to two feet. Uh, a handful of animals have been recorded at 30 inches, almost three feet in length. You can see she's already quite sizable, but she'll continue growing for quite a while too. So they are a sexually dimorphic species. Simply by size, you can tell the difference between the two. And being boas, you can also tell the difference between the two because if we were to look at the uh, vent at the base of their tail, in males they have a tiny little set of spurs on either side of their vent. Females generally don't have that. Those spurs are the last remnants of legs from the ancestors that the snakes uh, used to have when once upon a time when they did have legs. Boas and pythons are one of the few groups that have retained those tiny little remnants but females have gotten rid of them. Males still retain them, they think, as use in part of the uh, mating process, where they will use the spurs to kind of tickle the female to make her more receptive to breeding. So these guys, uh, they start out fairly small, and we'll see that in a little bit. And then as they grow up, it takes two to four years for them to reach maturity. Males being smaller will reach maturity faster than females usually do. Uh, males, one to two years. Females usually recommended, if you're feeding them at a correct rate, they will mature at between um, three and five years of age. And then when they actually go into a breeding cycle, uh, it's usually during the spring season. So in winter, now in their range in Africa, there aren't really huge temperature differences where they live, but there are uh, minor uh, seasonal changes, and especially in rainfall. So winter is often a drier season for these guys, and that will trigger them to kind of go off food a bit. Uh, they'll kind of hunker down for that period. And then as the rains come back, makes them active and brings out food again, they start moving around. In captivity, we often uh, switch that up with there is a small drop in temperature during winter that will trigger these guys to go through their seasonal cycling. And then as the temperatures warm up again, females begin to ovulate and males start moving around. They go off feed usually and won't eat for months, which 
can be a bit aggravating because you think there's something wrong, but it's perfectly normal for a lot of males to just stop eating for a long period of time because they're focused on finding females. So the male will track down the female. Once he finds her, he'll initiate uh, kind of a mating uh, ritual where he'll come up onto the female and slide up across her back, rubbing his nose and chin against her, and then again using those spurs that he has to kind of uh, encourage her to breed. And then they'll stay locked for anywhere from 15, 20 minutes to a couple of hours in which the male uh, transfers the sperm into the female and then they go their separate ways. Now, unlike a lot of snakes, uh, sand boas, like most boas, are ovoviviparous animals, meaning they incubate the eggs internally and then end up giving live birth to the babies. So the females, once they've mated, will really pack on the pounds, hunting, eating as much as they can, and they will balloon up to sometimes ridiculous proportions. Uh, if you had seen her when she was actually uh, in her breeding cycle, when she was actually ovulating and incubating uh, the babies, she almost tripled in diameter. So they get quite large, and then they will incubate those babies for several months. Because other snakes, they'll usually develop their eggs for six to eight weeks, give or take, um, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, depending on the species, before actually depositing their eggs. But then um, they will lay their eggs, and then those eggs will continue to incubate for between 50 and 100 days uh, outside in uh, the environment. With live bearers that retain the eggs, they continue incubating for that full period, so she's gravid for several months, five, sometimes six months at a time, as possible, before finally giving birth. Now, <clears throat> if you want to actually keep these guys, uh, they're pretty easy animals to set up uh, because they don't get very large. They don't need huge uh, enclosures. Now, it's always recommended, of course, to give them enclosures that are at least two-thirds the length of the animal. I recommend, if you can, preferably, give a cage that is at least as long, if not longer, than the animal, and again, space in both dimensions. And though these guys aren't typically climbers, uh, I have seen them be quite active. Both of my snakes are fairly inquisitive animals. Marmara especially, she loves to uh, look around, check out what things are going on. So if you give them a little bit of headroom, sometimes you will find them using that as well. So, um, because they're burrowing animals, you want a substrate that they can actually burrow into, kind of leave tunnels in the substrate. So, a somewhat sandy uh, soil type substrate is good for them. Uh, that holds a little bit of moisture, but not a whole lot, because again, these are from somewhat arid environments, so you don't want a really humid enclosure for them. Uh, aspen bedding is another good one as well. It doesn't do well with moisture, so if there's a problem there, it'll tell you. Uh, you want to have that at least two to four inches deep, if not more, so they can actually get down under that substrate and uh, burrow through it at several different levels. And then on top of that, it's best also if you give them a couple of hide areas uh, at both the warm and cool ends of the tank. And then again, a couple of branches, some rocks for them to climb on, to bask on if they so choose. And then because they are burrowers and because they are used to finding the heat uh, coming from above the soil, it's best to give these guys a heat using some sort of lamp system. So uh, it's recommended always uh, if you can use UV, do so. Again, these may be fossorial and nocturnal, but they will come out sometimes to utilize and bask under UV if it's given. So if you can, give it. Uh, if not, then uh, ceramic heat emitters or other uh, good infrared uh, A and B emitters that will provide uh, significant warming power to one end of the tank. Uh, use those, because that way the surface of the soil will be the warmest part. You can see him trying to dig into my sleeve here, because again, they're burrowers. They like to hide, and they don't really have much concept of 
uh, what sleeves are. <laughs> so we'll put him uh, back in this substrate over here. Let him burrow. But you want to give them warmth on the soil surface so that the surface is the warmest and they're used to that. So they will go up to the surface in that part of the tank to raise their temperature. And then if they get too warm, they can burrow down and away from that point so that they can cool down. Uh, that's the most natural for them. You can work with heat pads under the tanks uh, in some cases. Uh, as long as those pads are on one side of the tank only and the whole tank isn't uh, warmed up by that so that they have a gradient. So the warm temperatures, you may give them a basking area of n up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit and then cooler areas that are around maybe 75 to 80 degrees so they have a good gradient that they can choose from. And then again, because they're uh, fairly dryland animals, you don't want to have like a huge water source in the tank that will increase the humidity. A uh, small container that they can find and drink out of something that sits about level with the soil surface so they can pop out, find the water, drink a little bit, and go back. It's not common that we see them drink because they don't really need it a whole lot, but every now and again you might get lucky and it is an adorable thing. So once that's set up, they're usually fairly easy animals to take care of. They're docile. I have never been bit by any of the sand boas that I have worked with. They're very inquisitive animals once they get used to you, especially it seems the females. Uh, Irwin is more shy than Marmor is. Marmor likes to poke around. So they do have different personalities, and when you're looking for one, you can try and find one that's um, kind of fitting to the personality you'd like to see. Uh, it is good to keep in mind though that overall even the most inquisitive of these guys are fairly shy reclusive animals so most of the time especially during the day if you go to look at their tank it's going to look like you have an empty tank of soil and that's about it so best to keep that in mind if you were trying to get one of these as a display animal probably not the animal to work with but if you want something that you can take out and handle for a little bit that's cute and docile uh, especially as a beginner species that's not hard uh, to deal with, these are a good example. Now, <clears throat> there is a little bit of detail that goes into when you're dealing with babies, of course, and we'll get to that next. Would you believe they start out that small? Babies barely uh, come out six, eight, maybe ten inches long at most. And, uh, when they hatch, or not when they hatch, but when they uh, are born, uh, the female can have anywhere from six or eight to maybe a couple dozen at a time. Uh, Marmara actually had a pretty high number for her first litter. She had 13, one of which was stillborn. But the rest have been doing pretty well so far. We've got a handful still that are looking for homes. And uh, when they're born, uh, they, are, they come out in of a small sack, the amniotic sac, that then they break out, and that's kind of their version of hatching out of an egg, because they develop in basically a uh, membranous egg inside the female. And it's quite an exciting thing to see them when they come out, too. Here's a clip of when I actually found my first litter. <laughs> hey, everybody. I am coming to you on the 16th of August, to share an amazing thing that I was not expecting to find already today. Not for you, Fides. Go lay down. We've been waiting on Marmara, who looks really, really skinny all of a sudden, to uh, bring us a little surprise. And boy, has she. There are baby sand boas all over in the tub. Let's see if I can pull one of these guys out here. Oops, come here. Look at that tiny little sausage. And so, once they're uh, born, usually it takes about a week or so before they uh, shed for the first time, and then after that, 
is when you start trying to offer them uh, food. Now these guys, uh, because they're very shy, they're burrowing animals, they can be a little touchy to get feeding. Some of them, I had one female who they'll start off uh, taking frozen thawed pinkies right away. Others need a little bit more convincing because um, they're not used to large things messing with the container that they're in, of course, in the wild. There's no such thing as that. They're just going out and finding small lizards, uh, sometimes rodent dens that they will raid. But there's a lot of tricks that you can use to get them feeding. Uh, if they don't take frozen thawed right away, uh, of course, the next step is you can offer live because a lot of them will go straight to that. If that doesn't work, uh, there's actually a trick that works for a lot of stubborn babies where you boil the pinky mice for whatever reason that changes the scent and then some of them will take that. Or scenting sometimes works. Uh, since in the wild a lot of the things that these guys will be eating will actually be small lizards, if you can get hold of a gecko or an anole uh, to use, like a frozen uh, gecko that you can store in the freezer, take that and rub um, the femoral pores underneath the legs on the pinky or stick the pinky's head in the uh, lizard's mouth to get the saliva and the smell on there or sometimes if that doesn't work you actually skin it a little bit and then rub uh, the blood and internal fluids on it sounds gross but it often works for a lot of them that want something else's food and then you just kinda keep trying other things um, until if there's no other options uh, sometimes you have to resort to force feeding I've got two that are still not wanting to eat on their own so I'm having to do that until they decide that they actually want to eat food on their own but that's always a very very last resort and a very touchy thing uh, you don't really want to do it unless you have guidance from somebody else or experience beforehand but once they get feeding of course they're usually pretty reliable uh, and they'll continue feeding throughout uh, the warm uh, season, summer uh, and spring, and then the males sometimes more so during fall as they go into the breeding season will go off of food. But once you've got them going, you start out with a baby like this, you might have that baby as it grows up, turns into adult, for anywhere from even 20, 30, 40, maybe longer years because uh, they are very, very long-lived animals. So it's one thing you want to keep in mind if you are getting a Sambo as a pet, this is not a short-term thing. This is an animal that may be around for more than half of your life. So choose wisely when you're picking out a pet. So you just saw the babies and you just saw, again, how long these guys can live. They are a very long-term animal with mine. I've only had them a few years, so I will probably have these guys until I may be 60, 70, 80 years old before these guys actually pass away as long as they're kept well. So, uh, if you're interested in the Sanboa, certainly, you can hit me up, or there's a lot of places that you can find uh, them online at pet stores. They're very common pets, so it's not hard to locate one. Just make sure you've done your research and you've got a good setup uh, before you get them. But that's about all that I have for you guys today. Uh, until next time, as always, again, uh, you can find me, help support the uh, videos and such at patreon.com slash hcarlton. Uh, members there get uh, special exclusive benefits back. Or you can also do one-time donations at coffee, ko-fi.com slash carltoncarnivores. There will be other links in the description below, and you can always find more photos and videos and clips on social media at Carlton Carnivores. That's here on YouTube, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. I can be found all of those places. But until next time, I'm Hawk and Carlton. This is Marmara, and this is Carlton Carnivores.